Good afternoon. I'd like to call the regular board meeting for July 19th at 5 p.m. Um, in front of us, we do have an agenda. Is there a recommended approval of the agenda? Changes? No recommended changes. I move we approve the agenda. So moved by Mr. Cleveland, second by Ms. Morrissey. All in favor? Is there a motion to go into executive session to discuss personnel and student disciplinary records? So moved. So moved by Mr. Cleveland. Second. Second by Ms. Light. All in favor? We are going to. All right. Well, good evening. It is 6 p.m. Uh, we would like to resume our regular call board meeting for July 19th. Uh, we have to make a motion to come out of an executive session. Is there a motion by Ms. Light? Second, second by? Second. Uh, Mr. Uh, Cleveland, second. All in favor? All right. We are out of the executive session. Is there a motion to approve personnel AA1, A1 through 89, B1 through 53, C1 through 4? So moved. So moved by Mr. Cleveland. Second. Second by Ms. Morrissey. All in favor? Is there a motion to uphold the Tribunal Appeal for Student Record 22-195. So, so moved by Ms. Morrissey, second by Mr. Cleveland. All in favor? Perfect. If we could please let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, but liberty and justice for all. All right. In front of us is a consent agenda. Has everybody had the opportunity to review the consent agenda? All right. Any questions about the consent agenda? Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. So moved by Ms. Morrissey. Second. Second by Ms. Light. All in favor? All in favor. All right. The next item on our agenda is presentation and discussion items. The very first item is with Mr. Hamill, the finance report. Good evening. Uh, today we're going to talk about the June 20, 22nd uh, financial statements. These are the initial financial statements. We'll have the finished ones done next month when we get ready to close out year end. As always, we remind ourselves of about goal efficiency three. So for June 30th, 2022, we began the month off with about $131.3 million into the month with about 112.3. This is the start of the year where we start drawing down our cash balances as the property tax doesn't come in for a couple of months until October. As you can see here, we're actually 104.5% on our revenue collections. A couple of things to point out. Um, Avalorm taxes came a little bit better. Our real estate transfer tax, our TVAT tax, interest earned. Um, and of course, with the QBE supplement we received this year, austerity money came back that also increased that amount that amount as well so right now we're about 23 million dollars above what we had budgeted and the majority of that's coming from the qbe extra money that's because we were, received our austerity cuts the budget was fully funded in the end correct and the supplemental money was about 10 million dollars and um well almost nine million dollars and then the austerity money we came back was a little bit over 10. On the expense side, you can see we're at 99.87% of our budget. Um, so we're pretty much right in line where we thought we would be this time of the year. On your debt service cash analysis, um, we're at $51.4 million in their debt service account. And we're getting ready to make uh, the August 1st payments. So that's going to be about $30 something million. SPLOS 5 is sitting at a robust 55.8. Um, the Treasury market will close that here soon, and we'll have that anymore. And, of course, SPLOS 6 came in at a good $4.9 million. And FYI, we have predicted about $4.4 million a month over 
entire five years, and right now we're averaging almost 4.89, 4.85. So we're ahead of schedule right now on that. So a total amount of, for debt services related accounts is about 117 million. Special revenue, uh, as you know, special revenue is made up of school nutrition as well as all the federal funds. School nutrition is pretty much done for the year, but we still got about three more months activity for all the federal funds that haven't been in here yet. When you mentioned federal funds, the federal funds in the past we've all received was the CARES funds, the CARES funding, which is separate, but the CARES funding was something we couldn't control, correct? That was right. So the CARES funds, um, as you remember, when they were first put out in CARES Act 1, they were based on Title um, 1 participation, and we are very, very low. And then when uh, CARES Act 2 came out, they also did in Title 1, and so one of the things I did on behalf of the school board was I reached out to the state of Georgia and said, you know, we prefer that if you could to reach out to uh, people at the federal level and ask them if there's any way we can change that to a different uh, motive or way of getting the money. And of course, the federal government decided Title I was the most efficient way for them to do it. So unfortunately, the state had to pass the money out that way as well. So we had no control of how that money was coming down to us. And if you think about it, our Title I population is so low, we only got a grand total of $23 million between all the different CARE Acts and the American, um, uh, the American Act as well, compared to like, I think the CAB got 568 million, Cobb got almost 500 million, Fulton County got 400 something million. It, we're very low in the total pool. Of the money that's left, we have a little bit of money on the set aside we still need to spend over the next year, and that's for instructional purposes only. And then we got the almost $4 million, a little bit less $4 million for the two ERUs that we're still going to draw down uh, in the next 12 months as we finish those projects up. But there's nothing we could have done to apply for anymore because it's based on our free and reduced, our Title I. There's Correct. nothing. Okay. Thank and you. Here's Who the made the decision to use that formula? Was it done by the state? It was done by the state, right? state had to follow the federal guidelines on that. And the federal government said it had to be all Title I uh, distribution. So here's the thing that's crazy. If we didn't have a Title I population, we would have gotten no money. So that's what's just crazy about how that was done. We technically have a low percentage, but we still have a fair number of students, but compared to other systems, we don't. Right. For example, the Clark County where I used to work, that entire county is Title I. So for a school system that's only got 16,000 kids um, and 21 schools, every school got Title I money. It was almost $9 million just for that school system alone compared to us. And we get like a million dollars this year, I think, or a million one. And yet we're the fifth largest school system in the state of Georgia. Correct. Thank you. Um, capital projects and school food services. So capital projects um, right now is down to about $29.9 million, $29 million. That's just cash on hand. That's not necessarily everything we have in that fund to pay for stuff. The thing we do want to point out, though, is the school nutrition end of the year will bust $18 million fund balance. We do have a deficit built into the school nutrition fund for the next couple of years. Um, and that will draw that balance down. My understanding is as long as we have that in place, we should be good with the state of Georgia on that. The investment summary, right now we're sitting on about $120 million in total cash in our investment funds. Uh, LJIP fund has about 51. Uh, SWAS 4 still has about 2.7. SWAS 5 has got the 55.8. And then, of course, um, Splot 6, which we're working with now, is up to $9 million. And if I'm going back and forth, don't I mean, just because I'm trying to focus, uh, it's a little harder with uh, the Zaya surgery I just had. Um, so here's the good news is if we look at the end of Splot 5, and this is the final chart we'll have for this. Next month, we'll just go Splot 6. Uh, we collected uh, $213 million out of $195 million. So that extra money is sitting in SPLOS 5 funds for future use, and we've already talked about that in the past and how we're going to use that. But the good thing is, is if you look at the last 12 months, it was averaging 4.6, and we're just slightly ahead of that right now with the first two collections of SPLOS 5. And, of course, you can see SPLOS 5 is 4.8, 4.9, the first two months we collected. Um, ending cash balance for the elementary schools is about $4.5 million. All the activity is normal. The middle schools is about 1.7. Their activity is also normal. And the high schools is about 6. Their activity is normal for this time of the year. 
and uh, high school makes up about 49% of all the cash balances. They're a little bit ahead of last year. Um, elementary's dropped a little bit, and um, middle school's dropped a little bit as well, percentage-wise, last year. In total, they got about $12.2 million. Any questions? Questions? No. Nope. Nope. Perfect. Thank mm -hmm. you. The next item on the presentation and discussion items is our local school council report with Mr. Mitch Young. Mitch, maybe start by just talking about, about what the local school council is. Sure. So yep. Let me pull not. these up to make sure I got them here. Yeah, so each, uh, per state law, each, each of our schools has what's known as a local school council. It's made up of the principal, of parent representatives, teacher representatives, and business representatives. Uh, a lot of schools go above and beyond that and may have, uh, and from time to time, a, a, a student involvement or you know, some other, other stakeholders that are involved. But bottom line, these, these groups are there to sort of get the, the inside scoop from the principal as to what's going on. It, it, it's a group that is there to ask really pointed questions and, and find out uh, for instance, last year, strategic plan is, is one that you'll see on all these. So as we were going through that process, this was a great place for principals to share all the details of what was going on with that. When we have a SPLOS referendum up, this is a group that, that quite often folks from the district office will go and address a local school council so that they can uh, get more details as to what's going on. So they're really, they, it's a conduit between the principal and their particular community. Um, and, a, and a great place for principals when, it, when it's done the, the right way, which most of our principals do. It's a great way to sort of bounce ideas off that they have, uh, that they would like to do locally to kind of get the pulse of their community. But also it's a great place for district initiatives to be explained uh, so that so the parents really know as, a, as opposed to the rumor mill, they can really get the, you know, the true story behind it and then share that with the community. Um, yeah, absolutely. So it's expected each year and, and I'm not going to read through all these with you. Uh, they're they're on the the, uh, the information you were you were given prior to the meeting, um, but just to just to confirm with you, all of our schools, elementary, middle, and high, uh, are required to meet a minimum of four times with their local school councils. They have to publicize those uh, ahead of time. And I can tell you that all of our schools this year did meet uh, a minimum of four times, which is great. Um, our school councils all had the the representatives that they needed to have on there, which included parents, teachers, business representatives. Um, and the topics, if you look at the elementary, uh, middle and high, I've got the elementary pulled up right now. And if you just take a quick glance at the topics discussed um, and you compare that to what was discussed at the middle schools, let me get that to pull up. All right, if you, if you look at that along with the middle schools, and then I'll do the same thing here in a second with the high schools. You're going to see a lot of similar conversations. I think this this, this past couple of years, um, you know, it's probably probably the same same situation. Here he goes the, with the high schools, and what dominated the conversation, it, it, especially early on, the last few years, has been the challenges posed by COVID. Uh, student and staff wellness comes up at all three different levels that we have. The challenges of of uh, staffing and substitute teachers this past year was a, was a big uh, conversation in a lot of these meetings. And then last year's initiatives, PLOS 6, dominated a lot of the conversation, accreditation, the strategic plan, and then you'll, as you scroll down on all these, you'll have a, a lot of what have been common every year that we've had local school councils, which are things like uh, activities that are coming up with each school, whether it's fifth grade graduation ceremonies or high school graduation ceremonies, updates to how extracurricular uh, activities are going, uh, school safety and discipline. Um, so those are, those are all included on there. It's a summary of all the, uh, all the major topics that were covered. At the end of each year, we ask the local school councils, as they sit with their principal at the last meeting, to provide any recommendations they may have. And these are collected and sent directly on to, to you guys. And um, again, on each of these sheets, elementary, middle, and high, you have verbatim what was provided to, uh, to the principal, who then passed that on to us, all the recommendations they have for the upcoming year. Uh, I've shared that with you on this. Uh, I'll be sending out a, a spreadsheet 
that has those on there. And then one of the things we like to do each year is have your collective thinking go into those so that we can respond to each of the uh, schools with what your thoughts are on each one of their recommendations. Our staff here is at your disposal as you need more information and more details, perhaps to those. And as we get that information back from you over the next couple of weeks, um, we'll look forward to helping put together letters of response with you that we can send out to each principal and each local school council. So any questions over the next two weeks that you've got on any of these, uh, our whole cabinet and, and staff are at your disposal to, to be able to give the, the most uh, accurate and, and full response that you can. Questions? Will the uh, annual report be posted publicly? I believe all these that, that, were, uh, that, that were posted tonight will be, will be available. Um, just like all of our board meetings, it'll be included in all the information that's up there okay. for sure. Yep. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Our next item is the divisive concepts complaint resolution process with Ms. Leanne Rice. Good evening. Last month, I presented policy IKBB, which is our divisive concepts, conflict resolution policy. Uh, this is in response to House Bill 1084, which is also known as the Protect Students First Act. We posted the policy online and accepted public comment. And based on some of the comments that we heard, I felt like we needed to clarify a few points about the purpose of this policy uh, and what it's supposed to do. As I said, the policy is a directive from House Bill 1084. Um, that law states that each local board of education must have a complaint resolution policy in place by August. First, it is also it also clearly defines what divisive concepts are. These are all this statute is all race based, and so these divisive concepts are described as things like race scapegoating or stating that one race is superior to another race. Some of our public feedback talked about other topics, and so I did want to make clear that this is a race based statute. Um, I do want to make sure that we thank all of the people who submitted their feedback. Uh, one of the things I love about Forsyth County is the relationship we have between the schools and the board and the community. And public feedback is very critical as we move forward, especially in some of our um, more challenging topics. The feedback itself seemed to encompass three different themes. Um, one group of commenters represented our educators who were very fearful that they may not be able to teach the standards, the Georgia standards, to the level and the depth that's required by our state. And so I did want to make clear that the law specifically states that it is not intended to violate rights or undermine intellectual freedom and free expression and that teachers should be free. This law does not prohibit teachers from discussing topics in a professionally or academic appropriate manner as long as they are not espousing their personal political beliefs. When you look at the depth of the standards, some of our standards um, cover some, some tough topics. For example, our fourth graders are covering westward expansion, civil war, reconstruction. These are nine and 10 year olds who are discussing some tough topics. One of the standards in particular says that they have to be able to explain how slavery was replaced by sharecropping and how freed African Americans or blacks were prevented from exercising their newly won, won rights. And so I wanna be clear that some of the discussions that are happening in classrooms, the verbs that discuss the standards that our students are expected to uphold, do expect us to be able to explain and discuss and analyze different historical events. And so this is generally starting in elementary school, but also going up through our high school, uh, AP history, world history, US history courses. So to our educators, I do want to say that the law specifically says that they have the freedom to teach to the level of the content. Another group um, of feedback that we received talked about wanting to um, review all the instructional materials. That is actually covered under House Bill 1178. 
and allows parents, that's under the Parent Bill of Rights, and that parents do have the right to review instructional materials. Now, two of our state codes define what instructional materials are, and they say that those are the principal source of study for our state-funded courses. We're very transparent in the instructional materials that we use, and you can find on our district website on the Teaching and Learning webpage a list of every principal resource, instructional resource, that has been approved by our school system that we use to teach those state-funded courses. In addition, on the middle school and high school syllabi that families receive during the first week or two of school, we list that core principal resource that we use to teach materials. Another section of comments talked about wanting to make sure that we were clear on consequences for employees who may violate this policy. And I'd like to state that it, with any um, situation that occurs, our personnel matters are confidential, but we do follow our policy for code of ethics. And anytime there's a complaint or a concern, then our building leaders and our district leaders do respond appropriately to that. Above all else, I'd like to recommend to everyone, we, we in Forsyth County employ the very best teachers. We are so blessed in our district to have a group of educators who are as dedicated um, as they are. And I think we've seen that over the last two years with everything we've experienced from COVID and the way that our educators have gone above and beyond to serve our families and our community. I'd like to ask that we also extend our grace and our trust to our educators. And with any situation that a parent or a community member might have with a concern, always have a conversation and reach out to our teachers and our principals if anything comes up that they have any questions or concerns about. I think that sometimes we rush to judgment without getting all of the information. And so I would encourage anyone, an educator, a student, a teacher, a parent who has concerns to have a conversation. Our conflict resolution policy outlines the steps when that conversation is not successful. So with that said, I'm happy to answer any questions um, that you may have about this policy, but then I would ask Dr. Bearden to make a recommendation that we adopt our policy as written. Are there any questions? I appreciate you clarifying the questions that we have. They were excellent questions, and again, I do thank our community for submitting their feedback and allowing us to, to clarify anything that may have been confusing. There were a lot of new laws passed this year. I thought your example was really good, too. And the instruction is not going to change how history was. We still have to teach how history was. We just have to be careful about it. But I think you, I like the way you broke down the, the, the questions and how the different categories were. I thought that was very helpful. And our most important advice to teachers is that their personal beliefs should never come through in any situation. We teach to the level of the standards. Sometimes there's a lot of depth and rigor and, and some discussion to that, but their own personal beliefs should never come through in a class discussion. And actually, uh, under the consent agenda, you, you did approve this policy, so you do not have to go back and, and revisit it. I just wanted to make that clear. No, I just want to thank you for your time because I know you spent a lot of time going through this and I know that the bill was very important to our community and, and you going through um, and spending the time to gain the knowledge, get legal expert advice and to kind of understand it from both perspectives. Uh, you didn't have to go through all that, but we really appreciate that and, and your professionalism showed in that. So thank you. Ms. Leanne Rice for your help on that. Thank you very much. I just want to reiterate, I know Leanne said this, but I think it's so important, you know, for, for parents who may be uh, watching tonight or those in the audience, uh, anytime you have a concern, the best course of action is to talk to your classroom teacher directly and try to get that situation resolved. And obviously, if it cannot get resolved at that level, we have a process in place where you can meet with building level administrators, so forth and so on. But it's always best to have a conversation with the classroom teacher first. 99% of the time, things get cleared up when that happens. So please continue to communicate with, with us. And as you said, there were no, a number uh, of new laws passed this year that we will have to implement. And, and we will work with our teachers to make sure we implement those with fidelity. And so just a point you. of education too, the standards aren't set by this board. Correct. We, no. uh, we inherit them and then we teach to them from the state. So if you have a problem with the standard, understand the standard very well, but then solicit who makes those standards and you know have that discussion 
Thank you for bringing that up. That's We teach the Georgia performance standards and that it would be if you have an issue with standards, that's a state issue, not a local issue. We have to teach the Georgia right. standards. Right. Correct. And I, I thank you for bringing that up, Mr. Cleveland. I would encourage any parents who want to know more. It's a very easy um, way to find them. They're at georgiastandards.org and parents can search for any subject area, any grade level, and they are listed exactly out. And that's, and that's what, come a long way over the years. I remember when my kids were young and in elementary, that's the first thing I went and looked for was what are you teaching these kids and trying to understand that and that's the place to start is look at those standards really understand them and I'll say you can be a part of the education process too. understand the standards implement it in your life in your home when you go to the grocery store that type of stuff when they're learning that standard teach it through life and it's one of the easiest ways so you have input into their learning thank you thank you, thank you. Next item of points of information. Is there any points of information? Uh, just two. We have our new educator orientation Friday at the uh, Focal Center. We'll be welcoming our new family members to Forsyth County Schools. So we're excited about that. And our newest school, New Hope Elementary School, we have the grand opening uh, Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Anybody in our public is welcome to attend the grand opening at New Hope Saturday at 10. All right, the next item on our list would be public participation. Uh, before we move into public participation, I do want to take this opportunity to just highlight our six sections of our public participation policy. Um, our meetings of the Board of Education are held to conduct the affairs and business of the school system. Although these meetings are not meetings of the public, the public is invited to attend all meetings and citizens are invited to address the board at all regular board meetings. All remarks shall be made to the board as a body and addressed through the chair. Remarks shall not be addressed to individual board members. Personnel issues involving individual employees, issues involving individual students, and pending litigation are not subject to public participation. Speakers are asked to keep their remarks civil. Any profane, rude, defamatory remarks, and personal attacks will not be allowed. The chairman of the board is responsible for enforcing this policy, and speakers who are found in violation will have their allotted speaking time immediately concluded. By reading and acknowledging acceptance prior to speaking during public participation, speakers attest that they understand and will abide by this policy. Failure to abide by this policy may result in forfeit the right to participate in future board meetings. We have a new system in place. I don't know if everybody's had an opportunity. I know Mr. Kershaw has, um, but it's the light. Um, and in front of this, on the podium right here, you'll have um, a light. And the green means you have three minutes. Uh, when the yellow light comes on, that means you have 30 seconds left. And then when the yellow light starts to flash, you have 10 seconds left. And then when the red light comes on, you will have a buzzer and your three minutes are up. So, as of every night, uh, the word is respect. All speakers and audience members must be respectful. This is a business meeting. Speakers must follow the public participation policy. Audience members may not clap, make noise, or speak from their seats. Again, my word of the night and every night is respect. So, at that point, we'd like Mr. Kersel to come and lead away. Let me sign up first. Get first crack. Okay. Happy July, the birthday of the greatest country ever, the United States of America. Some people believe that our country is not great, but rather inherently systemically racist. But no one can point out any country they think is actually better. In the year 2022, we still have active slavery across Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. We have government racism in India with scheduled castes and classes. No European country has nearly the diversity or inclusion that is the basis of America. And despite an ever-expanding federal government, no country in the world has ever had as much freedom as we enjoy. Of course, the history of our country, like any other country, is filled with bad things. You know, Democrats chasing black Republicans out of Forsyth County in 1912. Democrats with, you know, their party power on the backs of slaves, founding the KKK, imposing Jim Crow laws, uh, you know, destroying black families with welfare programs, discouraging black fatherhood, or the careful placement of abortion clinics to reduce the black population. But more than any other country, our history is filled with good things. Republicans spilling their bloods on the field 
of the Civil War to free the slaves, strong protections for the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and the right to keep and bear arms, grand victories in both world wars against the fascists, and victory in the Cold War against the oppressive communist Soviet Union. Even in 2022, under the most corrupt president and Congress in history, we can still be grateful for a Supreme Court willing to stand against executive overreach, to stand for unborn lives, and to protect our right to keep and bear arms. So what will we focus on? Will we wallow in what makes us angry and resentful? Or will we rejoice in what makes us feel gratitude and hope? I choose to let go of resentment and forgive our Democrat brothers and sisters as I would hope they would forgive me, rather than holding them eternally responsible for the sins of their fathers. Even as an atheist, I see incredible value in the idea of forgiveness and repentance and atonement. And I know that a focus on gratitude makes all of our lives better. So let me declare how grateful I am for Forsyth County, for its school board, its superintendent, its schools, its people, and its freedoms. As a refugee from the People's Republic of California, I am grateful to live in a state that ended its lockdowns in April 2020 instead of continuing them until July of 2022. I am grateful to live in a state that respects the Second Amendment. I am grateful to live in a state that protects our school employees and school students from ideological indoctrination. In California, children are regularly abused with sexually explicit content, sexual grooming by teachers, medical procedures performed without the consent of parents, and state-supported indoctrination to try to turn children into far-left activists. In Georgia, we have strong support for laws that criminalize such behavior. That being said, I understand that the fight will never be over. There will always be some reason to encourage people to be resentful rather than grateful. There will always be some ideology trying to push its way into our institutions to crush our freedoms. But there will also always be good, grateful people willing to stand up and take their turn at resisting the forces of resentment. Thank you very much. And I would love to have lunch with anyone who disagrees with me. Thank you. Our next speaker is Miss Meta, but I don't think she's here. Oh, I'm sorry. You were hiding behind the podium. I didn't even see you. Come on up. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't see you back there. No problem. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Shivi Meta, and I'm a rising sophomore. My pronouns are she, her. Members of the board, the time is now to listen to your community members who have been attending for months to speak out, to, uh, speak out for justice. The school year is due to begin in a few short weeks, and giving, which this gives you all a window of opportunity to make the right choice. Reverse the book bans and implement a diversity, equity, and inclusion policy. This de this, the decision to ban books had no input from students who you all are here to serve. We deserve a board accountable in, in and to serv service of all of us, not a, no not a noisy and radical minority. Further, now is the time to implement a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan. The support that this plan would provide for all students is vital to student well-being and success. For Sight's future as a quality school district depends on this board's willingness to stand up for students left behind. DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, would often would improve our district's education quality as we've shared for months about the many ways our communities across Forsyth would benefit. For example, improve mental health, in increased feelings of safety and reduce bullying on the basis of identity. These benefits improve school performance and productivity. DEI is an all around improvement for Forsyth County Schools. Students like me and my friends have spent months arranging transit to get here, standing up for what we need and speaking up here, despite how intimidating a school board meeting can feel. When it comes and we can feel when it becomes a when it becomes a political ba battleground for bigotry. We are not here to be disrespectful or to disturb the meetings. We are here to voice on our need for a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan and our right to read about people like us all. The children coming after us deserve better than censorship and hate. Thank you. Thank you. And our last speaker tonight is Mr. Randy Suggs. Hello, sir. That was two tough acts to follow there. <laughs> um, hey, uh, first of all, uh, I'm a big supporter of public education. I uh, really respect public servants in this current tough environment that everybody's in. But, um, uh, and I realize you all have already adopted a budget and a millage rate or whatever, so I'm probably wasting my breath on this. But I feel obligated to protest this exorbitant tax increase for this year. You know, my taxes are up 25% this, this year. 15% last year, 12% the year before. Since we built our house, we've lived here for 30 years. Our taxes have gone up almost 7x over what they started, right? <laughs> it's just, it's gotten to the point, it's just ridiculous. 
and I feel like the board, the school board has an obligation, because you talk to the county people and they say, oh, it's not us, it's the school board, right? That's the reason your taxes are so high. And if, if the county's growing that fast, I feel like somebody's not paying their fair share. You know, new people or, or builders, developers that are building apartments or whatever just aren't paying their fair share. Because there's no, if 20% if more people are moving in, then the revenue base ought to be up 20%, and it ought not just be put on the backs of the existing homeowners. So I guess what I'm advocating for is that the school board should work with the county tax commissioners to develop a, a fair plan for funding the, the revenue needs that the school has. So that's my, that's my piece. I'm not really questioning the budget. I know the county's growing. If it's growing, there ought to be more people to pay taxes and not just the existing people that are paying more. So that's my piece. Thank you very much for your time. I just want to take this opportunity to thank all the speakers for being respectful tonight. Uh, that is our last item on the agenda. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved by Mr. So, second. Light, second by Mr. Cleveland. All in favor?